Thank you everyone for joining us this morning on our webinar, Azores and Porto. And, and so uh, I want to get started right away. Uh, very quickly again, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment during our webinar, the button mark chat is at the bottom of your screen. Just click on that, type in the message and we'll be monitoring that throughout and I'll be answering all the questions um, at the end of our webinar. So let's, uh, let me give you uh, the preamble for those of you who've joined us on our webinars before you will uh, um, just bear with me for a moment. Wheel and Anchor, we are about bringing travelers together. Um, and uh, this is a new, a new slide we've stuck in with some of our friends that have traveled on different trips with us. Uh, and, um, you know, the one thing you can see is, is that we always have a lot of fun and we, we are all about um, bringing people who have a passion for the type of travel that is not just um, mass tourism, but rather it's all about um, people who are already well-traveled and who um, um, want to meet other travelers to have, you know, very, you know, unique experiences around the world. So that's what our mission is at Wheel and Anchor. Uh, and my personal goal for each of, each of our members is, well, you're already well-traveled, but the degree to which you can get out in the world, experience new places uh, and new traditions and cultures and food and beverages is just makes you a more worldly, a more, um, uh, I just think, think it makes you a better person. Uh, and in the process of doing so, we become connected not only to our fellow travelers, but to um, people that we meet along the way. And so uh, I've had a brilliant um, life of travel so far with lots more in store. And, and I, um, I look forward to sharing that with you and hoping that you'll also all become well-traveled as well. Um, <clears throat> so who's joining us on the call today? Uh, so I am Gordon. I'm the founder of Wheel & Anchor that uh, many of you will know already. Um, I'm joined by my co-founder, Joel, who is in the background and looks after our technical support. Um, and Paula is here as well. She's also in the background. Uh, monitoring the chat channel. And we have one of our two special guests today. Unfortunately, it looked like we had some technical problems. So uh, joining me on the screen as well, you'll see Ricardo Oliveira. He is our partner in Porto, Portugal. Uh, and he's going to be sharing with us some of his thoughts about his beautiful city uh, and the environs. And uh, yeah, we seem to have had some technical difficulties. Evaristo from um, the Azores was supposed to be joining us as well, but um, he's not here. So I'll be telling you all about the Azores from my own um, from my own travels there. Our plan now is taking you. You are um, folks that are interested in Portugal, in particular the Azores and Porto, uh, and I get to be your guide, literally in this case as well, because I am going to be hosting this trip personally uh, and bringing you all to visit these two magical places, which I love. I was saying to Ricardo earlier, I could move to Porto. This is my kind of town. Uh, and uh, we're going to be taking a look at both of these destinations where we're going to be traveling in November of 2020 to the Azores only. And the combo program Azores and Porto will happen in April of 2021. Just uh, a, a little bit of a note about uh, the Azores in particular, because um, I know that uh, uh, many of our members actually don't even know exactly where they are. And, you know, it's a group of islands in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, they're almost halfway between the eastern seaboard of Newfoundland, so our easternmost point in Canada, and the European continent. Um, they're a little bit more than halfway, which makes them quite accessible because the flight time from Toronto is about six hours, uh, just under six hours um, non-stop you can fly in. So it's not much more, it's, it's less frankly than it would take to fly from uh, Halifax to Vancouver, for example. Um, so we can get there in a hop, skip and a jump. And then Porto is just um, a couple hours further. And uh, these islands of the Azores, um, which are volcanic, volcanic islands, much like the Canary Islands and Madeira and so on, and all these islands in the Atlantic, they are brilliant. This is a photographer's dream. Um, and uh, some of you may have seen some of the photos that I've taken there. They appear in some of our uh, marketing material. Um, it, is, it is absolutely brilliant. The other nice thing about it, because people ask me all the time, November. Well, I went to the Azores last November, and I swear to God, it was 21 degrees. We had sunshine. I swam in the sea. Uh, it, is, it is an amazing um, climate there. So um, let's take a quick look at the map of our program. 
where we're going to be going. The first part, of course, is the Azores. So that this is the program that we're going to be doing in November, which will be just the Azores, as well as the first part of the program in April. Um, we fly into Ponta Delgada, which is the capital of the archipelago of the Azores that you see here on the island of Sao Miguel. And we're going to be spending most of the time in a town called Furnash that's on the right-hand side of the map. It is in a volcanic crater, and it's known for its hot springs. I'll get into that in more detail. But we're going to see most of the island of Sao Miguel. Uh, and uh, as I say, that'll be in our November program. And then in April, um, Ricardo's going to help me tell you a little bit about uh, Porto, uh, this city in the northern part. Portugal. So let's uh, not take any more time, but jump right into our day-by-day -day itinerary. Uh, and um, and as I say, I uh, regret that uh, Evaristo is not able to join us today. So I'll, I'll be giving you a little bit of a highlights of what we can expect to see. We fly out of Toronto, as I mentioned, is uh, which is the easiest gateway, frankly, because uh, the they have nonstop flights from Toronto to the Azores. Uh, in November, they go uh, three or four times a week. Um, in the summertime, they actually go daily. Uh, and uh, we go nonstop to arrive in Sao Miguel in the airport of Ponta Delgada early in the morning, where we'll be picked up and brought to our hotel. And on the way, one of the things that we will hopefully go up and see is this uh, Lagoa de Fogo, which is one of the two um, most notable crater lakes that you see in the Azores. Um, and I've actually had opportunity to go and down and uh, uh, hike down the side of the, this um, crater and, and go almost all the way around the lake. And it is just spectacular. What you don't see in the pictures of all of the Azores is that you have this incredible scenery inside the island, but you are then circled, of course, by the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, which are cobalt blue. It's truly magnificent. Uh, and so we'll arrive in early in the morning. We're going to stop for breakfast in the city of Ponta Delgada. It's not really a city. It's more like a town. Uh, and uh, we will continue over to Furnash. Uh, and um, then just wondering if we're having some technical difficulties. Joel, you'll let me know if there's any uh, uh, te technical difficulties. Okay, so it's all back on. Um, <clears throat> The one thing you have to know about the Azores is that being uh, an island, being a, a group of islands in the Atlantic is, is the weather can be very changeable. So um, I had a great deal of luck when I was there last November, uh, and, uh, but it could be anything at any time. And, they, and one of the co common phrases that they have is uh, that uh, if you don't like the weather in the Azores, wait 15 minutes or drive to the other side of the island, which takes also about 15 minutes. Um, and so we have a particular itinerary they're gonna follow, but in conjunction with our partners over there, Ibaristo, we are going to be um, adapting it according to what the weather is actually like. This particular spot here, this Lagoa de, de Fogo, is uh, at the, near the top of a, of a high volcano, which is often shrouded in clouds because of how high it is. So if the weather is not looking great, we're not going to drive up this day. But if the weather is, we're going to get up and, and see this magnificent view of the crater. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, I see Evaristo has joined us now. Uh, and anyway, I'm going to let Paula and Joel uh, try to solve the... Uh, uh, the technical details on that. I'll continue on. We're spending four nights in Furnash, which is at the bottom of this crater, um, and at this very special hotel called Terra Nostra, which uh, the, the hotel is quite lovely in and of itself, but what makes it in a particularly interesting is that it's set within a, a botanical garden and it has its own um, uh, thermal water lake. I, 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 it's a, call it a, a large pond or a small lake. Um, and it, it's within the property of the hotel uh, with all these botanical gardens around it. It is absolutely magical. Um, they've won all kinds of awards uh, for, this, for this facility, uh, as well as for their spas, which I will tell you about in a little bit. Um, and this will be our base for four nights. So we can really stop and enjoy. And the program is designed for both people who are more active, as well as for those who just want to relax and enjoy, enjoy the spas that they have um, here at, uh, at Terra Nostra. So, uh, so as I say, we'll be, um, we'll be in for, um, we'll be in there for four nights. So, um, okay. So apparently Evaristo, ah, Evaristo, how are you? 
Okay, I can't uh, hear yeah, his. I go to. Ah, there he is. Okay. We are together. I'm driving the okay. uh, well, just back to him. Thank you, thank you for joining our our webinar this morning. Uh, I'm I'm sure all of our members will be uh, thrilled to hear from you. I, we we were just starting to talk about the Azores, and I was just explaining our first day that we arrived um, in uh, Fornash, where we're going to be staying at the Terra Nostra Garden Hotel. Uh, and so people will undoubtedly be a bit tired um, from the from the journey, but uh, we we're gonna we're gonna either. Uh, uh, on our first day, either allow you to enjoy the facilities of the hotel and the uh, the thermal lake, um, uh, and just wander around the town. It is truly beautiful scenery because you can see the sides of the crater almost um, all the way around, and it you wouldn't even know that you're in a crater because it's such steep sides of these these beautiful mountains. Um, before we go on, though, so the, the next the next day we're going to be we're going to spend the next uh, three nights of so four nights in total in Fornash. Um, and uh, I, I'd love to hear from you, Evaristo, and your your team in uh, in the in, in São Miguel. Um, what are some of the highlights that our members can expect to see uh, in in the things that we're going to visit over our our, our stay in um, in São Miguel? Okay, uh, so Evaristo, Evaristo uh, told me to to speak you uh, to to speak with uh, with you guys because uh, largely I'm going to be the, the tourist guide who will be with you. Oh, so, fantastic! So you can expect besides the um, the fantastic views and viewpoints that we have, the beautiful landscapes, you can expect always a history, a legend about something that happened. Uh, about the lakes, about the first settlers. For example, in our way to um, in the first day, we will do it for the south coast and we will stop in a viewpoint called Pizan. So allegedly that village, a pig, dig a mountain. So uh, that's a funny story to tell about, uh, to tell about and to speak. Uh, it's also a very interesting uh, viewpoint uh, about Calerda, which is a fishing uh, we have a, a little fishing harbor down there, but it's also uh, one of the best places in the island to live about the weather, about the, the, the beautiful landscape of basalt that exists in that part of the island. And it's the most expensive place in the island as well to, to own a, a summer house. So uh, uh, the, the pig story is really, really funny. So if you don't believe it, just, you can wait to, to hear it. Yes. <laughs> and uh, of course, all the, the south coast is absolutely amazing with the beaches around the, that, uh, that, that we can see. It's Villa Franca do Campo was the first capital of the island until the earthquake in the 16th century. So um, there's also uh, some stories that's, uh, that we will speak about. And of course, uh, the local pastry that you can taste, Quejadas de Villa Franca, and we will stop Cheese there. <laughs> It's a little, yeah, it's uh, sort of a cheesecake. So yeah. uh, in the way that we are going to Furnish, like I said, we're going by the South Coast. So you can expect already a little bit of that. And then we will speak about our local traditions as well uh, that we have here in the island, several of them. Like I said, several stories about Furnish, for example, has one also very, very interesting about the first settlers that went there. Uh, but that one, I will save it to tell you Personally, yes. otherwise okay, I will tell everything, and you, when you guys come, yeah, I don't have anything to say. So uh, okay, great. Okay. And the other, of course, set uh, Dutch. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Gordon. Yeah, yeah. No. So um, uh, what I want to just do is is get a sense from you of uh, um, the some of the highlights of things that 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 our our members are going to see. Um, we have all the details in our brochure that's going to be sent out to our. Um, to our members, um, but I, I know a couple of the things that uh, are of particular interest are this dish that you have there called, and I'm going to pronounce it cor incorrectly, probably cozido or cozido. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the cozido is a traditional meal that we do here in the island. We dig the pot, we, there is a, a hole in the fumarol field of Furnish, so uh, we put a pot of iron with several types of, uh, of meats, uh, there is beef, pig, uh, pork, chicken, several vegetables, and then we still include some local sausage, like we call chorizo and musala. Mm. And then that goes to, to cook under the ground, on the, only with the heat 
uh, inside of those holes, usually between 90 degrees Celsius. And uh, it stays there for cooking between six to seven hours. We, we, yeah. we can see them digging that hole again, taking out the pot, and it's served on the local restaurant, and it's a, a treat here in the island. Also, many, many families from the island goes there in the weekends to do it themselves. So yeah. uh, really, traditionally, I still remember we, with my family, we still do, we, we used to do that uh, really early. We go there like 6 a.m., we, we put on the hole, and then at one o'clock, we will do a meal just in front of the lake. We, the lake is surrounded by, a, not surrounded, but has a small part of the lake. It yeah. has a park and several tables, so it's a picnic park. And you can can do that with family, but we will do it at the restaurant. We will see them uh, taking out the pot from the hole, and then we will eat. We will have our meal in a restaurant because all restaurants here they do it like that. Yeah, perfect. Um, and so uh, one of the other things that I know that we're going to see is um, uh, we're going to visit this village of Nor uh, Nordeste. And again, my pronunciation is probably going to be it correctly. Uh, Nordeste. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Great. Uh, and and uh, uh, my recollection of it is is all about these spectacular views because you like you have the Atlantic Ocean sort of spread out all in front of you. But I understand there's also a very, very interesting little museum or something in Nordeste that talks about um, yeah, sort of the, the labor the labor house. Casa yes, that's Vario. what it is. Yeah. And so uh, we'll have a chance to uh, to visit that one as well. I guess when we're in Nordeste as we pass through. Yeah, yeah, we pass by the. It's in the village, so we pass by. You also can Perfect. expect to see the waterfall from uh, Veldneuve. Uh, also, the the park with the the old mills, water mills, as well called Ribeira dos Caldeirões. And yeah. like you said, and and well, the fantastic viewpoints that uh, Nordest has to offer. Yeah, uh, Nordest is also a place where you can see the first sunlight of the day. So uh, between 6 a 6 a.m. usually in the summertime, you can see the the sun the, the sun coming uh, sunshine in that part of the island. So we will visit that those points of views as well. And like you said, and and well, the the fantastic viewpoints and the landscape to the Atlantic Ocean and the, the green of the island to the mountains as well. Yeah, fantastic. We'll and and we'll see th this uh, the tea plantation. And I remember I was there. I didn't go into Goriana, but. They yeah, are, uh, and this is all part of the North Coast. This, yeah, this, yeah. Uh, with which has a very different um, landscape. Um, sort of landscape than it than than you'll find in Nordeste on the on the east. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it is very weird for me. I mean, I only remember seeing tea plantations in like India and Sri Lanka and so on. Um, well, but they're still making tea here. Sorry, I'm sorry. They're, they're still making tea here. Yeah, yeah. In, in Europe, the there are the only tea plantations that exist. Which is a kind of funny because we are islands. But of course, we belong to Portugal, which is a European country. But the only tea plantation that exists in all Europe, it's uh, the Goriana tea plantations, which are the only ones, uh, as well the tea plantations of um, uh, Port Formoso. But this one is the one that exports uh, worldwide, including Canada. You can buy that for sure in Mississauga, which uh, the Portuguese community over there. <laughs> You can buy in a Portuguese store for sure. All right. Well, we'll I'll make sure to tell our members in Mississauga to look out out for, or better yet, just come to the Azores and buy it directly at the yeah. factory. You just have to see a Portuguese store all, all over Toronto for sure. Mississauga, it's a place <laughs> that I know, so I'm already telling for sure you will see an Azorian guy over there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we, like we, said, we we know a few. Um, and then. Europe. When we after we leave Fornash, as we 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 will uh, head back for our last night, which will be staying in Ponta Delgada. But um, we're going to visit the the west coast, um, which of course the highlight being Sete Ciudades, the the twin lakes. Um, that I was always told it has something to do with the story of a, a shepherd and a princess or something. Is why these these lakes that are directly adjacent but have different colors to them. Yeah, you are correct. Uh... And the, my work is going to be really easy with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you are correct. Uh, there are several legends. The one that we speak more or we spoke more uh, is the, the legend uh, of the little princess with the green eyes who fell in love by the shepherd with the blue eyes. So, uh, but uh, usually I tell two, one with a happy ending and one with a sad ending. 
So, <laughs> you know, love has to do with tragic. So, uh, of course, uh, not the happy ending. Sometimes it happens. But yes, you can expect, of course, uh, me to tell you the, um, that legend. And we will visit that, uh, that village also. And the, the Twin Lakes, the Blue and the, the Green Lakes, they are considered the first natural beauty of Portugal. So, ah, uh, that's so. okay. Yeah, yes. We, we, it was something that the Portuguese government did a couple of years ago, 2011. Uh, 2011. Ivaristi is saying me that. So, uh, to promote the seven uh, natural wonders of the country. And here in the Azores, we want to. So, and Setsidaj was the first one to be elected for the old, Portuguese, old Portugal. So it was a national uh, vote, uh, votation. So, uh, and yeah, the landscape to, um, of the Vista do Rei, which is the name of the viewpoint because of the visit of the, the last Portuguese king who allegedly, because of the natural beauty that he can saw, is, he, he told to the people that was with them in the 1901, which is the date of the visit that he did to the islands, that that view was only worth to be seen by the eyes, through the eyes of a king. So uh, he was a little bit modest. <laughs> so uh, Don Carlos was the king, by the way. We visit that with Don Amalia, the queen. And uh, there's also an abandoned hotel over there with a funny story, yeah. Italian mafia. So uh, <laughs> lo lo lots, of, lots of interesting stories that go beyond yeah, the... You uh, also can the, expect uh, yeah, a little exactly. passage in Setsi Dutch to, uh, from uh, the Devil's Throat which yeah. is another uh, viewpoint over there with a different uh, viewpoint, but also you can see uh, lakes of Setsi Dutch, not only the blue, but you also can see the crater of Santiago, for example. Yeah, yeah, well, brilliant things to see. Um, and I know that we'll enjoy our last night uh, in Ponte Delgada at Marina Atlantico and, uh, and have some a delicious meal. And um, before we fly off that day to um, uh, either our trip in November, we'll go back to Canada or in to, uh, to, to Porto in, in April, um, we get to do some whale watching. And uh, I just, just briefly, um, uh, I had opportunity to do it the first time I visited the Azores and uh, saw some incredible incredible marine wildlife. Um, what are the chances, uh, and I know that they perch these guys up in the hills um, above Ponte Delgada to, to actually spot for the whales so that you have a high chance of seeing, if not whales, some of the other marine life that uh, exists in the oceans around the Azores. Is, is that right? Yes, absolutely right. The Azores is one of the best places around the world to see cetaceans. And around our islands, you are able to see around 27 different species of cetaceans. Mostly wow. sperm whales, you could see them all year long. Common dolphins, Atlantic spotted dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, lots of baleen whales. When they are passing by migrate routes, you will have the chance to see them over here. Yeah. The people in the eight corners of the island, we call it locally the vigias, the locals. And they uh, are the in charge to, to scan the ocean and and then by the locals they will scan and they, they will find the animals and then and by radio they will lead the boats to the dolphins or to the whales wherever they yeah. see them. I remember that being one of the most fascinating parts of the story about being there is is knowing that these guys are perched up with their binocul binoculars yeah. pinpointing um, where the so that you have you 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 are almost guaranteed to see um, some some marine life. Um, well, we're going to have a we're going to have a, a fantastic time uh, in the Azores. I know every trip that I've been, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I can't wait to show our members. Uh, we were hoping to be there in March, but unfortunately, due to the uh, the, the pandemic situation, we had to put our uh, trip off until November. Um, but we have a lot of uh, people interested in it. It is an amazing destination. Um, Thank you both for joining us uh, for, uh, for that portion to give us a little um, direct from the Azores report on uh, what we can expect to see. And I'm looking forward to uh, meeting up with you uh, both uh, when, we, when we come in November. So um, thank you very much for your time. And um, we're gonna continue on to Porto uh, and uh, let Ricardo share with us some of his shots, thoughts on that. Uh, on that town. So, so as I said, our last day in Ponte Delgada, we will be uh, enjoying a wonderful whale watching and uh, marine life uh, boat trip. Um, and uh, in the afternoon, early evening, um, we will um, uh, 
um, fly out uh, in November, of course, where our trip's going to take us back to Canada. But in April, we're going to be going to Porto uh, and uh, uh, spending five nights in this truly wonderful city. Um, and we've got Ricardo here joining us from Porto um, to tell us a little bit about it. Um, we're going to be staying at a lovely boutique, ho boutique hotel right in the center of town, um, close to the um, um, Praça de la Libertad. Is that what you called it? The uh, Liberty Square or Independent Square? Is that what it's called? Uh, hello. Hello, Evaristo. So nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's very, very close. It's not in the same street. It's like a parallel street. But when you you're, when you when you mentioned that you have shoes in that hotel, I realized straight away that wow, it's it's very well located. Um, so um, as probably everybody knows, uh, Porto it's in the north of the country. So the country has few main cities. So Lisbon has the capital. Porto is considered the capital of the north. Okay. Um, and um, and it's a city. Uh, it, it's I used to say that uh, Porto. It's a combination of uh, history. It's a combination with art, with wine, and with the Portuguese gastronomy. And um, besides being a, a very busy city, uh, everyone that visits Porto uh, has a sense of place uh, of a vibrant city where locals uh, are are very mm. unique, you know. Uh, we have a different accent from the rest of the country. We have uh, different phrases for everything. So people used to associate the people in the north a little bit different. But I like that different, okay? Uh, we are in our unique way. Um, regarding this trip to, to Porto, uh, me, uh, my friend Bruno and Jose, so uh, we are representing our, our company, and um, uh, we have split uh, the experience for, for Will and Anchor uh, group uh, by three days, okay? Yeah. And three mm -hmm. days with different, uh, with different goals. Um, the, first, the first day, so it will be in the, in the 17th April, so the, fir the first contact with, with our guests uh, will be, uh, will be a, walking, a walking tour through the city, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the historical part of the city, which is considered yeah. a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Uh, there, there is a big reason why is that. It's because of unique art and the buildings with the old looking, very well preserved, uh, with a fantastic and, uh, and different um, uh, looking from the rest of the cities in, in Portugal. Uh, there is a reason uh, about that, because Porto, it, it was always a merchant city, so uh, with a lot of business people working with the sea and with the river, okay? Mm -hmm. Porto, it's located like in a, in a corner where we have the river coming from Spain all the way crossing the country and uh, ending in Porto. And Porto has also, also the other side, so the sea side. So we have river right. banks and we have the sea side. So uh, why not to create different experiences to enjoy? The, the whole city in a shorter time. Uh, Porto, it's not a big city, okay? It's, uh, it's not uh, even half than, than, than Lisbon, but, um, uh, but I believe five days, people will enjoy a lot. And exactly. we'll have uh, it, it will have a proper sense of place. I, I believe it's the, the right, right sentence. Um, exactly. Because, because uh, in the first day, we'll, we'll offer a walking tour, uh, but not a boring walking tour, only talking about the buildings. But, uh, for really? example, we, we, we are going to walk like half an hour explaining the, the beginning of Portugal because uh, Porto, yeah. it, 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 uh, it was part of the foundation of Portugal, not the birthplace, but it's part of it. Um, and uh, we'll go through the history, but also with the, with, the, with the buildings, with the churches. Porto has a lot of churches. Um, um, uh, historical buildings like a beautiful train station. It's considered one of the most beautiful train stations in the world. You can research San Bento train station uh, with, uh, with amazing tiles inside. Yes, amazing. Portugal has a lot of, of tiles and Porto, it's not different. Ma majority of the buildings have wonderful pictures built in tiles, okay? It's art. 
it's another piece of art, but from centuries, not 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 something new. Okay, uh, it was an idea from our 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 uh, our uh, people from previous generations. Uh, but on that during, first, during, during the tour, sorry, let me just ask you, uh, just uh, just to clarify, because uh, you're taking us to a tile painting workshop uh, on that first day, uh, that, where that, that's the. That's in the afternoon. That's right. That's the afternoon. So in the, in, in the in the beginning, we want to show the the well to talk about the history and show uh, the city with a gastronomy uh, a travel trip mm -hmm. as well. So we are going to to start with some uh, local appetizers like risol, bolinho de bacalhau. So uh, it's translating it uh, codfish croquettes. Uh, Pairing with uh, with some green wine, it's considered vino verde. It's a very unique wine in the world. Pro produce it only in the north. So we'll do a very a very pairing game with a, with a local gastronomy and Portuguese gastronomy. Okay, will not be only Porto, but what the locals eat more. Okay, uh, pairing with the, with the, with the Portuguese wines. Uh, as you know, Port and you guys already mentioned Portugal. It's uh, a wine country. So we have a lot to show, okay? So we have wines from the north until the south, and we want to show some samples about everything and to talk also a little bit about the wine, not something very technical, uh, because we could go, uh, because I'm, 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 I'm focused in that area as well. But anyway, the, the, the best is to, to show the highlights of, about the country and the, the, what the locals eat and drink. Um, and after that three or four hours, uh, walking, tour, eating and drinking, um, people will be will be uh, will not be hung, um, uh, hungry for sure, and we'll go to 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 have um, a session of a workshop uh, to paint to for uh, tiles painting. Okay, uh, we'll be with our friends. Um, yeah. With Alba and Marisa, so our, our uh, business partners. So we, we really love their workshops, and I truly believe they provide one of the best tiles painting shops in in, in, in Porto. And uh, they will they will go a little bit deeper in terms of history about the tiles, how they come to Portugal, blah 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 blah. And um, and the guests will have the opportunity to create their own tiles. Okay, so they will create two tiles per person. Okay, which uh, in the following day, I personally will deliver the tiles in the hotel to <laughs> to let them pack back home and to have a memory Fantastic. from Porto. Okay? We leave some room for the tiles. Um, yeah, it's. I think that's going to be an amazing introduction to Porto. Um, we've left a whole day free for the second day, and this is one of those cities um, from my own experience where. Um, and, you know, and I'm a big believer, those who travel with me before is, is allow free time because you just need to wander the streets um, and see all these, this me me amazing medieval architecture. Um, it is very up and down because of the steep hillsides and so on. Um, and there's lots of little gems that are not necessarily in the program. We were talking before we started the webinar about Livraria Lello. This is the famous <laughs> library that uh, is, is with this very weird sort of a, sort of a spiral a staircase. And in fact, it was um, known or it was reputed to, uh, to uh, um, be the inspiration for the Harry Potter movies. Um, and, uh, but we were just sort of quipping that JK Rowling that never actually went there before. So. <laughs> but nevertheless, it is one of these unique buildings that we'll see and, and there's a whole day yeah. Um, there, there to do that. But um, carrying on to the next day, um, obviously Porto is about port. Uh, and uh, when you stand on the banks of the one side of the river and you look over to the other, you see all of the labels. And and those of us, you know, that that you know know a little bit about our port, we can recognize um, some of these names of Taylor Fladgate and Sandemans and and so on and so forth. Can you give us a very brief? insight into port wine and the experience that we're going to have in gaining some understanding about port in Porto. Sure. Uh, so it, it, even in the first day, we'll pass in front of the, you know, in the riverbank yeah. and the people will have the opportunity to watch properly to that uh, landscape. Let's going to call it the landscape because yeah. it's, a, you know, it's a, in the other side of the, of the riverbank full of wine cellars and uh, in the, and 
it's part of the history as well. And we are going to introduce why they are there and why they have that looking. And um, yeah, so Porto, it's a, it's a city of wine. Okay, it's a city that gave the name to a proper wine, a wine that it's not produced in Porto. So it's interesting why a wine has a, a name that it's not even produced there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we'll, uh, we'll visit the, the wine cellars. The wine cellars uh, have giant wine vats, okay? And, um, and during the, 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 the wine cellars experience, the guests will understand what is port wine? Why uh, the port wine is made in that way? Okay, in in the, in, the, in a specific uh, mm -hmm. way of making, and how they are so different. So there are a lot of categories of port wine, and with their with their eyes, they will understand why a wine it's more uh, towny, like more gold, and the other wine it's more ruby, like a red color, and it's only possible when you have the barrels in front of you, okay? Uh, because uh, in, in the wine cellars, um, we'll talk again about the, the wine uh, history in Portugal, especially associated to the, to the, to the town. Uh, they will have a sense of being in a, in a, in a big wine cellar, not yeah. a small a small house or whatever. No, it's a, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's a proper wine cellar. Uh, very old, so majority of them they have more than 200 or 300 years old. Okay, so it's very easy to find uh, wine cellars uh, from 17th, 18th century easily. Uh, actually, majority of them they are they are uh, older than 200 years old, and uh, the the guests will have the sense of you know walking in the wine cellar, feeling the smell of the wine, the the the, the aging, feeling the why the wine gets certainly uh, characteristics especially because humidity, uh, humidity the, you know, there are a lot of reasons that, uh, that yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to interfere in the wine. And they will have that sense uh, how the wine, uh, it's developed there. We are going to visit two wine cellars uh, with different histories. One, it's 100% Portuguese uh, wine cellar. And the other one, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a foreigner. It's a British, okay? Why? Because England was always a Portugal partner in during, you know, it, were, it was always a, a, an, an ally, okay? Mm -hmm. Since the 16th century because of the French, blah, 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 blah. And England was always a Portuguese friend and they invested always in Portugal, especially in Porto. And why, it's why majority of the wine sellers are not Portuguese, but they are British or they, you know, they are French or uh, nowadays they, they have different owners. But the, the, the base, it was always the British. And the people, the, the, our guests will understand and associate properly why they have English names, uh, why they have the signs in, in the top, why they are located uh, almost in the end of the river, so before the sea. Uh, um, it's a magical place, you know, as Gordon already it's, said. It's, a, a, you know, a, you... you even if you don't like wine, we'll pop up a question like, why That's these guys are here? Why? Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. It's my experience uh, is that, that even for those who are not port wine aficionados, it's, uh, it's really a fascinating insight into, into this that you know, defines yeah. really what Porto yeah. is all about. Um, and, and on the topic of wine, you know, we'll have one other full day trip um, outside the city uh, to the Douro Valley, we'll head up to uh, Pinhao, I guess, which is um, already almost halfway across the country towards the Spanish border. And, and this is, um, you know, Porto is as beautiful as Porto is as a city. The countryside surrounding it is, has its own beauty because of all of these terraced vineyards that um, you've undoubtedly seen in pictures before. Um, and uh, we're going to get to taste more wine. Um, tell us a, just a, a little bit about, about this day and what we can expect to see in the Douro Valley. Regardless. Exactly. So um, um, people will visit the cellars, right? And they will have the idea and the history, oh, the wine comes from Douro, okay? And in the third day, in the last day, they will have the opportunity to go to Douro. What is Douro? Douro Valley, it's a, it's a wine region in the north uh, northeast of Portugal, like in the halfway to to Liz, to, to Spain, um, it's a it's a region very unique in the world. So you don't find 
a wine region like Douro. Why? Mm. Because the, the, the vineyards are planted in terraces, in very okay. steep mountains. And imagine the mountains uh, along the river, terraced like stairs with beautiful vineyards. So create very scenic, very, uh, very, it's wonderful landscapes. It's, it's not, it's impossible to not be amazed with such a, um, a, a beauty, a natural beauty. Actually, it was hand, hand built by, by man uh, centuries ago, uh, which still preserved uh, uh, very well nowadays. And, um, and uh, uh, in, that, in that trip, we'll go, we'll drive around uh, one hour and a half until we get the heart of Duro Valley, okay? Uh, and it's a, a very small village, uh, not a touristic village, okay? It's a very small town uh, where it's produced the best wines in, in, in Douro, okay, from Douro. Um, we'll visit a, a winery, a very old winery, which will be guided by a proper uh, wine expert, like a wine educator, okay? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They will not learn only, not only about port, because guests will be a little bit fed up of the port in the previous day. So, <laughs> <On> the day. <laughs> sorry for the term. And uh, we'll open the, the, the knowledge a little bit more not only port, but wine, okay, Doru wine, uh, because Doru it's not only port. It's you know it it, it is uh, uh, produce a lot of a lot of different wines, and uh, we'll visit that winery that uh, will be guided by a proper wine educator. After that, we'll walk a, a little bit, like five minutes walking until the the riverbank to to get the boat. Okay, we'll have a, a, a boat trip in the in the heart of Doru Valley. So we'll sail up the river, okay, until Tua, uh, in the direction of Tua and coming back. It, it will be in a, in a very traditional boat, in a cargo boat. Probably, Gordon, you remember to, to see the, 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 the cargo boats in Porto. So they Absolutely. are the traditional ones. So it yep. will be a private boat only for our guests, okay, um, with some appetizers, some wine, you know. It will be a very relaxing moment. Uh, after that... We'll, dri we'll uh, drive to another winery, okay, where we'll have uh, the opportunity to have lunch with a, the with a family, okay, with, a, with the owners of the winery. We'll yeah. host us privately only for our guests to have a, a traditional meal. Uh, usually it's meat, so in, in inland uh, where people used to eat more meat, don't used to eat fish in Portugal because it's a little bit difficult to have fresh fish. And when we don't, we, when we don't have fresh fish, we don't eat fish, basically. Uh, <laughs> besides, besides of cod, besides of cod, okay? Yeah. So uh, it will be uh, a very traditional uh, meal with a family, um, yeah. with a wine pairing, okay, with several, several dishes. Us usually it's five orders, okay? So yeah. it's, uh, it's very interesting with a lot of wine. And after that, uh, me and my colleagues will ask the guests to grab a glass of wine and we will do a walk through the vineyards uh, to see the, you know, the, to, to embrace more the landscapes and to feel the, the vineyards more, uh, more closer and to understand a little bit more about the VTV culture, so the, the grapes growing in the land. Visiting their, their facilities and then we'll come back to Porto. Our arrival, yeah, exactly. expected arrival time around 6.30. It's a long day. It's a long day. It's a long day, but it'll be a brilliant day. It'll be one of the most memorable days because of this incredible I'm sure. landscape that people recognize from uh, postcards and from uh, you know right. from having visited. And and again, that's the good news. You gave away the the surprise or surprise that you know we're gonna actually going to be cruising on the Douro River. A lot of people go to go on the river cruise boats. That's all fine, but we can see really a lot of the heart of this countryside. Um, on this wonderful trip that uh, Ricardo and yes. his colleagues planned yes. for us, and uh, I'm sure everybody will probably have a good sleep in the in the coach on the way back. And um, usually, everybody takes a sleep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's my experience as well. And we have a Fado evening in store as well. Fado is the traditional Portuguese um, uh, sort of. A, it's like a. It's like a dinner theater, if I can yes. put it in, in, in <laughs> those kind of yeah, terms. Yeah, that's, that's in the that's in the second day. Uh, be, uh, after after the the uh, in that afternoon, we'll take a, a also a boat trip in the in the in the in, the, in Porto, uh, crossing the six bridges of Porto, 
very soon yeah. will be seven bridges because they are already thinking to build another bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so there you go. So we get so not yeah. only do you get one, you get two Duro River cruises uh, for the That's price right. of stuff. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. after the after the that boat trip, we'll take the guests and we'll uh, watch the sunset in in the sea side of Porto. Okay, where the sun goes into the sea, and we'll have a very relaxing moment, enjoying a glass of champagne, uh, a Portuguese champagne. We call it espumante, um, yeah. uh, and uh, and it will be also a very interesting uh, moment because we'll show the sea side of Porto. Okay, we have. A lot of yeah. uh, uh, interesting beaches to, to show them. Uh, and we will go to a, a Fado restaurant. Okay, we'll give an introduction about Fado, or how it grew in Portugal, why it's so special, what it talks about, you know. And uh, we'll have the um, a proper Fado dinner show. It's how we call it. So um, we need introduction music, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, they will have dinner with the live show okay and they will have the opportunity to feel the real portuguese music okay fado yeah. it's the most portuguese music we have several categories but fado it's very unique okay it is it's so uh, it's 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 in our dna basically <laughs> if anybody's interested to know about fado music before you get there you can just google it and i'm sure you can find some tracks of fado music on yeah YouTube. it's very sentimental very, very heavy, it, very one, sentimental. It, makes you cry. It makes you cry. And it makes you have an extra glass of wine or an extra glass of port. Is my experience. Of we used to end with a happy, with a happy beat. So because there also there is also a happy father. So, but let's <laughs> gonna keep the secrets. Okay, <laughs> we keep the secret. Ricardo, thank you so much for your time. So we'll have five minutes in Porto. Um, let me uh, let me summarize uh, some of the details for you. We'll of course send you out a copy of our uh, brochure about uh, the Azores and Porto. Um, the program again, the Azores program in and of itself happening in the beginning of November. Um, we'll do the same program again in April together with Porto. Um, and you can see our prices here uh, um, for double and single occupancy. Everything of course as always in Canadian dollars. These programs include five nights in each of the Azores, um, where we're staying in two hotels, four, of course, in Terra Nostra, one in, in Ponta Delgada. Uh, and pretty much all, uh, certainly all of the transportation and uh, our English-speaking guides, like Ricardo, who you've met here, and uh, Evaristo in, uh, in, in uh, the Azores. Um, and, uh, you know, we like to run our programs so that uh, most everything is looked after. We work always on the basis of two meals a day um, uh, so we have a breakfast and either a lunch or a dinner um, and you'll see when you get to Portugal the meals are not small so um, I promise you're not going to go hungry uh, and of course uh, it'll be hosted by myself um, for the beginning uh, from beginning to end while we're in Portugal um, and as usual the only thing that is uh, left out of course is airfare which we are happy to facilitate for you um, there's a few different routes that are possible to enjoy this trip um, and those uh, those extra meals that are not included and probably not even necessary, uh, and of course insurance. Um, talking about airfare, um, it's a bit uncertain times right now, but uh, looking forward to uh, to November as well as April. Um, typically, you can fly from Toronto uh, nonstop to Ponta Delgada for about six fifty or seven hundred Canadian dollars, um, and you can do interestingly the whole round trip. Um, including uh, the leg between uh, the Azores and Porto for um, really only about 100 or 150 bucks more. Um, so uh, now those fares may fluctuate. So as, as I've been telling everybody, um, let's see what happens uh, post COVID-19, uh, but hopefully we'll uh, fall in line with that, which makes it actually quite a reasonable um, getaway for um, either the Azores only for five or 10 nights. Um, so let's get on to uh, some questions. I see a few questions have uh, popped in while uh, we were on the webinar, and uh, I may pass those on to uh, to uh, Ricardo as well. Um, so let me just uh, pull up the questions. Joel, you'll let me know any questions from the um, audience. Um, Marie asked, uh, what's the weather like in the Azores in November? Uh, well, as I mentioned at the outset, the, the Azores has a um, yeah, um, yeah, you know, how do they call it? An Atlantic climate. I mean, it's 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 obviously in the middle of the ocean, so uh, it's also in the middle of the Gulf Stream. So it is 
um, kept at a fairly mild temperature all year round, never gets really hot, never gets really cold. Um, I was there, it was around 21 last November. I would say you could expect that it use, would typically be um, in the mid to high teens uh, and maybe a little bit cooler at night. You could get rain, but it'll come and it'll go. Uh, it's a great time to go and because there's not many tourists at that time of the year. Um, <clears throat> John asked me, uh, how long a flight is it from Toronto to uh, the Azores? So it's about uh, just under six hours nonstop from Toronto to Ponta Delgada. Uh, if you are coming from other cities, you have to add the connection time on. Uh, and uh, but again, we can help you out with that to uh, to so you can figure out what to do. Coming back from Porto, um, there is a nonstop flight, but I think it's only operated by Air Transat, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, you can easily make a connection through Lisbon or through Porto. Um, then Mike asked about uh, actually, uh, this is a good question for Ricardo. What is the COVID situation right now in Portugal? Uh, how, how are things looking in, in Porto, uh, Ricardo? Um, regardless to COVID, uh, yeah. Portugal, it's ending the lockdown. Okay. So yeah. we are already available to open the, the airline. So it's, uh, it has to be a, a decision from other countries to let people to travel to Portugal because Portugal is already opening. Okay. Open, yeah. Until, until. Uh, end of July, everything has to be open officially. It was already said by the government a couple of days ago. Okay, so that's uh, that sounds really good. Uh, we are very optimistic that we'll be coming in November, and uh, by April, hopefully, a lot of this will be will be old news. Even though, um, yeah, there may be some travel. Uh, so the way we travel and the way we fly may change a little bit, but we're optimistic we're going to travel um, because Portugal has. Uh, manage the situation quite well. Um, Teresa asked me, is there the possibility to go on longer hikes in the Azores? Um, absolutely. So we have free time there as well. Um, while we're in Fornas, we've got a whole day at leisure uh, and you can go on quite, there's numerous hiking trails that are quite well marked. Uh, and I've done a couple of them myself. So um, the beauty of all of our trips is that we try to enable that you can see what you want to see and what you want to do. Um, some some of our folks will be along on this trip, particularly to enjoy the spa facilities and all the thermal water that the Azores is known for. Um, and others are coming because they can't wait to try the port wine in Porto uh, and uh, not to mention all the wine in the Douro Valley. So there's something really here for um, for everybody and we're going to try to uh, enable that. Um, then there's a couple of questions here about uh, deposits. So basically, uh, the, um, um, the, the I think it's, it's very difficult to say in advance how we would manage this, but as we've done with the other group that was supposed to come to the Azores in March, um, we simply bumped the trip forward uh, and we're going to uh, hold on to the deposits as long as possible so that uh, if for some reason uh, something should happen, um, that we would be in a better position to uh, to to refund them, um, but at the very least, all of our partners, um, frankly, everywhere, have been very very uh, helpful to allow us to rebook um, where possible. So we try to give our members as much flexibility as we can, uh, and uh, um, you know, as far as this trip in April is concerned, I, um, or even November, I'm actually not expecting anyone to sign on much before September. Uh, because let, we need to see how the next couple of months is going to pan out. Um, so uh, Fran and Eric asked about the size of the group. Uh, we had planned for the Azores to be about 16 people. That's how many were signed up in March. Um, I think that's about the right number, and I think we'll do the same for Azores and Porto. Um, somewhere between 14, but we definitely won't take uh, more than 20 at the absolute most, uh, because you know that's my philosophy. I like to travel in smaller groups. Um, good. I think that is all the questions, but of course, as always, um, uh, if you do have any questions, please drop us an email, give us a call. Um, Paula and myself are, uh, manning the, the lines and certainly the email. Um, so I'd love to hear from you and I do hope to, to chat with you all soon. And once again, Ricardo, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us all the way from Porto. Um, looking forward to meeting you 
uh, again Thank you very in, much. in April. And uh, yeah, and best of luck in uh, getting through the COVID crisis and to the rest of our members. Um, we'll see you very soon on one of our upcoming webinars. Have yourselves a wonderful day. All the best to you as well. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, all the best to everyone. And um, I, I'm looking forward to, to meet you next year. Okay. Thank you.